Well, good morning, everybody. How's everyone today? Good to see so many happy, smiling faces. Uh, it's going to be just a few minutes before we get into the Word this morning. Uh, I've got some announcements to make. You know, at the top of the list, um, my uh, first announcement is uh, Sarah is not here with me this morning, but I promise you, everything's fine, y'all. <laughs> everything's great. She's watching from California with my daughter, Destiny. Could we just give it up for Miss Sarah this morning? Love you, honey. All our other friends in California, I, w I spoke yesterday in California, got home at midnight last night, and I'm happily here today uh, to bring the word. So um, it's been a, a busy time. Um, so that's one of the announcements. One of the other announcements is, for those of you who, who may not know about Ambassador Services International, this is mine and Sarah's new nonprofit um, that we started last year, and it's the vehicle by which we're able to travel. Uh, we spend about half of our time in Washington, D.C., and, um, and are ministering to our nation's leaders, uh, elected officials, congressmen, senators, et cetera. And so Ambassador Services International is, is our nonprofit. If you go to steveberger.org, you can get a little bit more information about what we're doing there. One of the other things that we do is we have these Nights of Truth, Nights of Truth, and it's about every, you know, six weeks or so, ish, right around there, ish. Um, and we've got our next one coming up March 11th, and so we want to welcome you all. I think the registration is still open. These nights sell out, and so I just want to let you know that um, if you haven't um, registered yet, you should do it immediately. Um, and uh, join us at the, the factory in Franklin and Liberty Hall, and we'll have a great time together. We use these nights to, to speak truth about issues that uh, aren't being addressed a lot of times. Um, and so we want to encourage you to come out and to experience a great night of worship. We always have a great band there. And then we try to bring a great word so that when we leave, we'll be able to say that we encountered God that night. So Nights of Truth. Um, if you want to stay in touch with us, you can follow us on our new podcast, This Is That. Uh, I don't know where you find these things. I don't uh, even <laughs> pretend. I'm not even sure how to tell you to sign up. But uh, just go to steveberger.org, I'm sure. But um, you can go to uh, our Facebook um, um, is it called channel? Facebook? What's it called? Page? Did I say Facebook? I meant to say YouTube. YouTube channel. Whatever. Just, just find it and listen. We're doing a podcast right now, probably the most serious and sober podcast or teaching that I've ever done on the seven spirits of Sodom. And... Um, it, you might go, well, I don't know if I want to listen to that. Listen, I don't want to say it. <laughs> but somebody's got to. Yeah. Somebody's got to say something about what's happening in our country. So we really would encourage you, go to the YouTube channel, subscribe to it so that you don't miss these opportunities. Subscribe to our podcast and stay up to date with all that's going on. And uh, you will be the better for it. I promise you'll grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus in a way that you need to. So um, that's that. That's enough. This morning, uh, I'm going to pick up with the passage of Scripture that Pastor Ian gave me. And um, I'm going to be in the book of Romans. My message this morning is, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. And I want to just up front say to you that if you're here this morning or if you're watching online, and your faith is shaky, maybe, or you don't have faith. Maybe you've never met Jesus. I just need to tell you, just because you were born in America, it doesn't make you a Christian. Just because you were born into a Christian family doesn't make you a Christian. You actually have to be born again. That's what Jesus said. And so we're going to talk this morning about the gospel, um, what it is, and, and how to receive it, how to encounter it. At the end of this message today, without apology uh, at all, I'm going to make an appeal to you to respond to the love of God that's found in the Lord Jesus Christ. 
I'm going to give you the opportunity to open your heart up to God's love and forgiveness, his salvation. And it's going to take at least two things from you. It's, it's going to take some humility because you're going to have to say, you know what? Just like everybody else in this room, I've sinned and I've broken God's law. And I need somebody, Jesus, to forgive me. It takes humility to do that. But it also takes a degree of courage because you have to do it publicly. There's no such thing as a closet Christian. There's no such thing as just my private faith and, you know, uh uh-uh, 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 uh-uh. It doesn't work that way. And so Jesus called every single person to him, and he called them publicly. Again, there is no closet Christian. You've got to make a stand for the Lord Jesus Christ. So it takes a bit of courage. You know, you've got to walk the aisle. You've got to grab the preacher's hand and say, I'm ready for Christ. And so we're going to do that this morning, humility and courage. I pray that it touches your heart. If you don't know Christ this morning and that you would know him before you leave here, you would give your life to him. If you're backslidden, if you're not sure of your salvation, man, today is the day for you. Today's the day for you. It just is. And so prepare your heart to respond, all right? I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Pastor Ian gave us a great introduction last week. I just want to add to that slightly. Uh, The church in Rome was founded by who? Perfect answer. We don't know. We don't know who founded the church in Rome. There's different theories on this. Maybe it was... Um, one of the Roman visitors who were there at the day of Pentecost. Uh, It says there were visitors from Rome that experienced the power of the gospel. Maybe they went back to Rome and started this church. We don't know who officially started this church. When Paul wrote the letter, he had never been there before. And as we'll see today, the scripture says that he was hindered. He was hindered from getting there. There were obstacles and challenges from him getting there, but he still wanted to get there. He still wanted to minister to him. And so then he finally, he finally writes this letter in the spring of AD 58-ish. The spring of AD 58, he writes the letter that we call the book of Romans, the epistle, okay? Now, I, I just, I, I didn't plan on saying this, but I thought about this this morning, I just Maybe this is for somebody. Paul says that he was hindered from getting to Rome. And because he couldn't get there personally, he decided to write a letter. Aren't you glad Paul didn't get there? Because not getting there caused him to write this letter, which is one of the greatest, even secular people will acknowledge, one of the greatest pieces of literature if we are only calling it literature, in the entire world. And I just want to say this to you. Some of you right now may be dealing with what I would call a divine delay. Or maybe you're thinking that it's satanic hindrance and harassment and, you know, what you know that God was wanting you to do, it's just not happening and something's wrong. Well, maybe nothing's wrong. Maybe it's just the issue of perfect timing or different opportunity or different expression. The apostle Paul wanted to get there and see him face to face and minister to him face to face and he couldn't get there. But what he did instead was write a letter that's changed the world for 2,000 years. Don't think your delay is the end of your story. God might be setting you up to do something greater. That's not my message, but that's my message, (laughs) all right? So today what we're going to do, we're going to answer three questions. The first question is, why might Paul be ashamed of the gospel? Our second question is, what is the gospel according to Romans chapter 1, verses 16 and 17? And then finally, number three, how can I receive the gospel? And again, at the end, we're going to give an opportunity for people to receive the gospel, respond to the love of God for your soul. All right, Romans chapter 1, verses 13 through 17. Let me read our text this morning. Paul writes and says, Now I do, want you to, I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that I often planned to come to you, but was hindered until now that I might have some fruit among you also, just as among the other Gentiles. 
I am a debtor both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to wise and to unwise. So as much as is in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome also. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. Can someone say, thank God? For the Jew first and also for the Greek. For in it, in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. Now, one more time, beloved. Let's pray together this morning. Heavenly Father, we stand before your word with gratitude. We're grateful for your truth, Lord, that you've sent to us. Your word is powerful. It is sharper than any two-edged sword. It is able to pierce through our hearts to get to the very source of our being. It is able to set us free. And so may your word and your truth have its way here this morning. For everybody who would listen to this, both now or in the future, may the power of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ have its perfect way and work in every single one of us. And as a result of hearing this today, oh God, may it change every single one of us. We ask it in the name of Jesus, who is indeed the strong son of God, in Jesus' name, amen and amen. Let's unpack this just a bit. In verse 13 through 15, We see Paul's heart, his desire for the people in Rome. Paul wanted to go there again, but he couldn't get there. He sends this letter, as we said. It becomes this great writing. But Paul, he said, said, I'm ready to preach the gospel to you. I'm ready to preach the gospel to the Jew and the Gentile. I'm ready to preach the gospel to the barbarians, the rascals, the outlaws. I am ready to preach the gospel to every single person. I want to see the fruit of the gospel happen there in Rome. We want to see the growth of the gospel. He said, so I am ready to come and bring the gospel to you. Now, friends, look, can I say something to you? For those of you who are serious followers of Jesus Christ this morning, if you have a heart for people, you need to have a heart to share the gospel with people. You have to. Paul says it this way, Jeff. He said, he said I'm a debtor to both Jew and Gentile. Paul saw the gospel as something that he owed people. We owe people the gospel. We've been entrusted with it. God has given the power of the gospel into the hands and the heart of the church for us to give it away. And so if you have a heart for people, sharing the gospel with people, there's no excuse. Oh, I'm too shy. I'm too this. I'm too that. No, 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 no. Quit making excuses and share the gospel. It's the only thing that's going to save people's souls and turn this nation around. It is the only thing. It's the hope of the world. Now, Paul says something that I find very, very interesting in the first part of verse 16. He says these words. Right after saying, man, I want to come and preach the gospel to you, he says these words. He says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. I read that and I go, what's what's a curious thing to say right there? I'm ready to preach the gospel. Cody, I'm ready to bring it with everything I've got. And then he says, but I want you to know, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. So our first question that we want to answer this morning is, why might Paul be ashamed of the gospel? Why why might he feel that he has to address this issue? What is it about the gospel and potentially feeling shame about it, that he's got to make clear. He's got to clear this matter up with them. I'm going to tell you what it is. Why might Paul be shamed of the gospel, which he wasn't, but why might he be? And why does he need to clear the air? I'll tell you what it is. It's because of the circumstances of his life. We're going to see this is an issue that Paul dealt with his entire ministry, even up until the eve of his own martyrdom. 
the circumstances of Paul's life, they potentially could have caused him to feel shame over the gospel. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23 through 28, I would encourage you to read it every word um, by yourself. But Paul describes his life. Listen to this. You, you think you have a tough life? Listen to what Paul says. Paul says, man, I have labored abundantly for the gospel. I've been in prison. I've been at the point of death many times. I've received 195 lashes on my back. Paul graduated from the school of ministry and his diploma was written on his back. He said three different times they beat me with rods. Once I was stoned, three times I was shipwrecked, one and a half days I was just floating out in the middle of the ocean. He said, I've been in danger from robbers, from my own people, from countrymen, from Gentiles. I've been in danger in the city and in the wilderness. I've been in danger from false brothers. I've spent sleepless, countless sleepless nights. He said, I've been hungry, thirsty, cold, and naked. Dude. And then he says, besides the other things that happen to me daily. besides the other stuff, just kind of the regular stuff that I have to deal with. Again, Paul was imprisoned in Philippi. He was chased out of Thessalonica. He was smuggled out of Berea. He was laughed at in Athens, and he was regarded as a fool in Corinth. How many of you know the Apostle Paul's life was not easy? It wasn't, there was nothing easy about it. And so what he's saying by saying, I need you to know up front in the beginning of this communication with you, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. I don't want y'all thinking that I regret any price that I've paid. I'm not disappointed or embarrassed with the course of my life in any way, shape, or form. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. I want to be clear about that right up front before I say anything else to you in the following 15 chapters. Paul continues this theme, as I said a minute ago, of not being ashamed of the gospel in Christ until the very end of his life. This is something that's on his heart. It's on his mind. Listen to this, friends. While he's sitting in prison in Rome about 10 years after he wrote this letter, he's sitting in a Roman prison. I've been there, the Mamertine prison in Rome. You can, you can visit it. He's sitting in a Roman prison waiting to be executed. Nero's going to chop his head off for being a follower of Jesus. And he writes these words to a young Timothy, his final epistle, his final written communication in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 8, and then verse 12. Listen to this. Now, this is on the eve, the, the scripture says. He writes, this is on the eve of his departure. He tells young Timothy, he says, therefore, don't be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord. Don't be ashamed. Don't be ashamed of me, his prisoner, but share with me in the sufferings for the gospel according to the power of God. Verse 12, for this reason, I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep what I have committed to him until that day, that day that I meet him. Timothy, don't be ashamed of the testimony of Jesus. Don't be ashamed of me and my imprisonment and the things that I've gone through. Don't be embarrassed about it. I know, he said, that God is able to keep every single thing that I've committed into his hand. Nothing that man can do to me, listen to me, friends, nothing that man can do to me can thwart the purposes of God in my life. Even at the point of martyrdom, of being beheaded, he said, I know everything that I've committed to God, he is able to keep. He's not going to lose it. This isn't for nothing. Your struggles, they're not for nothing. 
Don't let your struggles cause you to be ashamed of the gospel. Good night, I can't compare notes with the Apostle Paul, but I'm telling you after 30 plus years of being a pastor, nearly 40 years of following Jesus, there have been plenty of rough things that have come my way. And you just have to know like Paul did, I'm not going to let the rough things define my life, my ministry, or my commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm not doing it. Paul separates, beloved, listen to this. He separates the potential shame and disappointment of temporary trials from the eternal power of the gospel which saves us from sins. There are two different issues for him. The gospel's ultimate purpose, friends, isn't to give you a comfy, cushy life. We've made that mistake in the West, particularly in America. Come to Jesus, your life will be great. He'll bless you with a big house and a fancy car and a beautiful family. You'll never have a thing go wrong. Hogwash! That's not the truth, that's a lie. You come to Jesus, he's gonna save you from hell on eternal, uh, in an, an eternal standpoint, but you might go through hell on earth, but you don't let what you go through subtract or decrease what God's eternal purpose is, and that's to save you from hell's flames. I'm gonna go through it now. He he, he tells us, he says, all of us who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus, we're going to suffer persecution. Anybody got that bumper sticker on their car? (laughs) No, of course not. But I want to teach the entire Bible. I want to prepare people for what's coming our way. Dude, it's, it's right. Look above our northern border right now. Look at what's happening in Canada right now. Look at what's happening to a member of of parliament in Finland right now. She's being tried in Finland for simply quoting a Bible verse. She might go to prison for quoting a Bible verse. These, These international things, beloved, don't think, oh, that's somewhere far away, that's over there, that's whatever, uh uh. These things set precedence for the rest of the world to follow. Tough times, challenges, struggles. I'm not going to allow those things to keep me from having faith in the eternal purposes of God. They are short-sighted, they are temporary. This too shall pass, but the power, the saving grace of the gospel shall not pass. It's been written in the blood of Christ and it endures forever and ever. Our next question, what is the gospel of Christ according to Romans 1, 16 and 17? What is the gospel? Anybody know what gospel means? Good news, this side of the room, you guys get the star on your forehead, you get the word. <laughs> These guys reprobate, lost as they can be. <laughs> the gospel is the good news. It's what it means in the Greek language. It is good news. I love what the late, great Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones says about this. He said, if the gospel isn't the biggest, best, greatest good news you've ever heard, you should be very doubtful whether you're even a Christian. The gospel The good news is this, that Jesus out of his love came and did for us what we couldn't do for ourselves. That's good news. I don't know if you've ever been in a place of vulnerability where you couldn't provide what you needed to have happen for you and someone comes alongside and does for you what you couldn't do for yourself. It is what, Diane, is it one of the greatest things ever to have someone do for you what you couldn't do for yourself? It's glorious. 
It's life-giving. It imparts hope and life and gratitude in us. Listen, there is no greater thing in the history of mankind than Jesus coming in our place, dying for the penalty of our sin because we couldn't pay the price on our own. He said, I got you. I got you. What love. What amazing love. No wonder it's good news. You remember what the angel said to Joseph about naming Jesus when he was about to be born. Matthew 1, 21. The angel speaks to Joseph and said, and she, Mary, is going to bring forth a son and you're going to call his name Jesus for, means because, he will save his people from their sins. He's going to do it. Jesus is going to do it. We can't do it. He's going to save us from our sins completely on his own. And what motivates him to do that? For God so loved the world. God didn't send Jesus to condemn the world. The world's already condemned. He sent Jesus to save the world from its sins. This is good news. Now, this good news, friends, listen to me. If you don't know Jesus for real this morning, listen to me. This good news, this gospel, it is the power of God, he said. I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God. This power of God is the power of God. It's not the power of self. This power of God is demonstrated, listen to me, in the grace of God. The power of God demonstrated in the grace of God. Ephesians chapter two, verse four, and then verse eight and nine. Listen to this. This will help us understand something. But God, who is rich in mercy, hallelujah, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. Verse eight, for by grace you've been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. It's not of your own works, lest anybody should boast. What does this tell us? This power of God, this good news gospel, it comes because of God's mercy. It comes because of God's love. It comes because of God's grace, our unmerited, uh, uh, unmerited favor, It means that we can't do anything to earn it. He just imputes it. He he charges us with it. He lays it upon us. Love and grace and mercy. And again, he says, it's not of yourselves. It's not of yourselves. It's the gift of God. I think people get so confused about the gospel Man, they think I just, I gotta work better and try harder and clean myself up and then I'll say yes to Jesus. But I I gotta get my act together before I do that. I don't wanna ruin your day, but you can never clean your act up. (laughs) And if you think you can clean your act up, you know what that's called? Self-righteousness, which that means that you're still dirty. (laughs) You're just guilty of something else. Well, I just think, you know, my good will outweigh my bad. And, you know, I, I just, you know, I'm, I'm, and I'm, I'm, Pastor Steve, I'm definitely better than the person sitting next to me. <laughs> the fact that you even think that, yeah. shame, shame. <laughs> it's more self-righteousness. Well, I'm not that bad. Do you know what the scripture says? If you break any part of God's law, you've broken the whole thing. So if you just look at the Ten Commandments and go, you know, like I'm, you know, I'm like six for ten. <laughs> if you're six for ten, you're you're actually zero oh for ten. Because if there's four of them that you think you haven't broke, but you have actually, if you think there's four of them that you haven't broke, it doesn't matter. You're still guilty because if you've broken one part of it. The word says you've broken all of it. So I need a savior. You need a savior. You've broken God's law. You're guilty. You couldn't pay the price for it, period, end of story. Doesn't matter if you're better or think you're better than anybody else. Uh Uh-uh. 
It's grace. It's love. It's mercy. That's what it is. It's not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, not of effort, not of trying. I remember several years back, some of you may have been there, I did a series called The Gospel. And we did this really unique thing. We handed out three by five cards one week, and we had people fill it out just to say, why do you think you're going to heaven? 80% of the answers we got back were wrong. The vast majority of that 80% was because I'm a good person, because I try really hard, because I do this or I do that. Only 20% of the people even got it right. I'm going to heaven for the sole reason that I've put my faith in the Lord Jesus Christ to save me from my sins, period. 20% of the people. So I'm just wondering in a crowd this size this morning, how many of you are gospel clueless? How many of you are trying to earn your way to heaven, work your way to heaven, be better on your way to heaven? It's not gonna happen. It's only going to happen through your, you putting your faith and the love and grace and mercy of God demonstrated through the sacrificial offering of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's it. And listen, it's a free gift. It's a free gift. Paul goes on in Romans, and we'll see it, I'm sure, in a few weeks, but he says this. He says, the wages of sin is death. In other words, what you actually work for and earn, if you think it's going to earn you heaven, it's only going to earn you death and eternal separation from God. The wages of sin is death, but what? The free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So what do you want? You wanna work your way to hell or do you wanna open up a gift and go to heaven? Which one is it? This is a no brainer. Like, come on, somebody, just say yes to Christ and get it over with, man. Settle this issue. Quit trying to work your way there, browbeating yourself, wondering, you know, if you're ever going to get there, you're never going to get there on your own. That's the bad news. The great good news is Jesus provided a way, and he's ready for you to open up your free gift today. Beats the tar out of any Christmas gift you've ever been given. <laughs> open the gift, man. It's the power of God. It's the grace of God. It's the gift of God. And it saves everyone who will believe. Everyone. Whosoever. For God so loved the world that whosoever. That means anybody, no matter who you are, no matter what you've done, the gospel will save you. Come on, there is nobody outside of the grace of God. There's nobody, the worst person in the world, if they would cry out to Jesus for mercy, the power of God is so strong that if they do it in genuine repentance and faith, they will be saved. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. If you're a whoever, call on his name and get saved this morning. Just do it, just do it. Listen to this. This passage starts off sobering, but it ends with gospel good news. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 11. Listen to what Paul says here. He says, don't you know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. Whoa. And then the good news kicks in. And he says, and such... Let's try that again. And such... Yes! Such were some of you. He's writing to the Corinthians and saying, listen, people who practice unrepentant sin, regardless of whatever it is, they're not going to inherit the kingdom. He said, and you know as well as I do, such were some of you. 
You used to be that way. But the power of the gospel and the love of God and the transforming grace of the Holy Spirit came and changed you forever. And such were some of you. He said, but you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the spirit of our God. I want to say as boldly as I know how to this morning, I am not preaching a wimpy, watered-down Jesus. I am not preaching a wimpy, watered-down gospel. I'm telling you, no matter who you are, no matter what your baggage is, no matter what your sin is, the gospel through the Lord Jesus Christ is able to save and transform your soul. It doesn't matter what your hangups, habits, or sins are. Jesus will save you like today. Today. You don't have to live like this any longer. You can be saved today. Paul's pre-conversion state, before he met Christ, what does Paul say of himself? 1 Timothy 1, 13 through 16, he goes, dude, I was, well, he didn't say dude. He said, y'all, I was a blasphemer. I was a persecutor. I was violent. I was the chief of sinners. But the mercy, grace, and love from Christ, it saved me. It saved me. And he said, God did it. God saved me to show everyone else the kind of people that Jesus can save. Your sin, friend, doesn't have anything on Paul's sin, I promise you. Jesus can and will save you today, right now. What else is the gospel? It makes us righteous before God. Think about this. It doesn't just forgive my sin. It makes me righteous before God. He said in 1 Corinthians 6, he said, Don't you know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? He said, but you say yes to Jesus. All of a sudden, you're made righteous with God. You have a right standing with God, not because of your own effort, but because of the love of God that's found in the sacrifice of Jesus. You have been made right with God. It gets settled forever the minute you open your heart and say, Jesus, I want you. You're made right with God. 2 Corinthians 5.21 It says, for God, he made Jesus who knew no sin. It means he was sinless. It's what allowed him to be the perfect sacrifice. For God made Jesus who knew no sin to become sin for us. Wow. So that what? We might become the righteousness of God in Christ. The righteousness of God, it's revealed through the gospel. We understand how to be made right with God, that it's not our effort, but it's Christ doing for us what we could never do for ourselves. Listen, I don't have to wonder every day. I don't have to wonder. He loves me, he loves me not. He loves me, he loves me not. I don't have to go through the day. Heaven, hell, heaven, hell, heaven, hell. No, my right standing before God has been settled forever through the precious and powerful blood of the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. It's been settled. It's been settled. This is how I'm righteous before God because of what Jesus did for me. No wonder this is called good news. No wonder Paul isn't ashamed of the gospel It's good news. It's the power, grace, and gift of God. It's for everyone who will believe, and it'll make them righteous before God forever. So now we just get to this, the the real issue here, okay? The real issue this morning after understanding the gospel is this. How can I receive the gospel of Christ? Like, Steve, how how can I get this in my own life? I know now, sitting here this morning, that I need Jesus. I do, I need him. I'm I'm not afraid or ashamed, embarrassed to admit it. I need Jesus to forgive my sin. Just like every other person in the world, I need Jesus because I've broken God's law and he paid the price for my sin. How can I get that? Steve, what do I have to do? It's real simple. 
In Mark's gospel, chapter 1, verse 15, Jesus said these words. The time's fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. It means it's right here. Jesus said, you have to repent and believe in the gospel. Number one, you want to receive the gospel? You have to repent. I grew up in a church structure where I was told just so long as you're one of us and come to church, that makes you right with God. Nobody told me I needed to repent except Jesus. Nobody at church told me I needed to repent. Nobody at the church told me I needed to believe and trust Christ with my salvation. Jesus said, you got to repent and believe. Nobody told me that in church. I'm here to tell you in church, you need to repent and believe. God allows U-turns. That's what, that's what repentance means. It means a change of your heart and your mind and your action, your attitude. You're just, you're no longer running away from God. Now you're running to God. You need to repent. And you need to believe. You need to trust and cling to the good news of Jesus. You just have to do that. Jesus said so. Understanding he paid the price for your sins. So you need to repent and believe. What else? John 1.12 you need to receive. The scripture says this, but as many as received Jesus, received him, to them he gave the right to become the children of God. Again, nobody told me I needed to repent. Nobody told me I needed to believe and trust Christ, that I needed to make a conscious decision to do that. Nobody told me I needed to receive Christ as my own, as my savior, me personally. He's, he's mine. You need to repent. You need to believe. You need to receive. And then finally, you need to confess. Jesus said these words in Matthew chapter 10, verses 32 and 33. He said, therefore, whoever confesses me before men, him I will also confess before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, him I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. So it's, it's not difficult. Repent, believe, receive, and confess. And my confession of my need for Christ can't be done behind closed doors. It can't be done in a vacuum. It, it has to be before men. Jesus, beloved, died for us publicly. He hung on a cross for us publicly. Surely we can confess our love and devotion and our need for salvation publicly. He did all the heavy lifting. He carried the cross. You need to confess. I need Jesus. I want Jesus. I'm receiving Jesus right here, right now. So I'm going to ask you to do something, man. This is the biggest decision you're ever going to make in your life. And again, God doesn't care who you are, how young you are, how old you are, how sinful you are, how unsinful you think you are. Right now, today is the day for you to say yes to the gospel. If you've backslidden and you've turned your back on God, like today's the day, get it right. Come back to Christ. You've never accepted Christ. Today's the day. Come on and do it. Today, say yes to Jesus. I'm going to ask every single person right now to bow your head and to close your eyes. And just for a few seconds, just think about what we've talked about this morning. Consider this morning whether you need Christ. Do you know this morning beyond a shadow of a doubt that if your body was to breathe its last, do you know for sure, for certain, that you would go to heaven, that your sins are forgiven, and that your faith is in Jesus? Do you know that for sure? If you don't know that for sure, you need to know that today. Let's settle that issue right now. He's ready for you. He's ready for you. The Bible says if You'll hear his voice. Don't harden your heart. Don't put it off. Tomorrow isn't promised. You never know. I'm 
I'd ask you all to bow your head and close your eyes if you haven't yet. If you're here this morning and you need to make peace with God through the love of Jesus Christ, through the goodness of the gospel, if you're here this morning and you need to say yes to Jesus, right where you're at, will you raise your hand up in the air? Raise your hand up. Wonderful. Great. Fantastic. Good. Who else? Wonderful. Good, good, good. Anybody else? Listen, your heart's beating out of your chest. I'm telling you, that's Jesus. He said, behold, I stand at the door and knock. He's wanting you to open the door and let him in. Anybody else? Put your hand up. Good. Once you put it up, you can set it down. Now listen, I told you up front, not playing games. I told you up front, it's going to take humility and courage. Humility to say, I need God and courage to do it publicly. Several of you, many that I saw, you raised your hand and said, I need Jesus right now. Right now is your opportunity. I don't care how many people you have to push by in your row, in your aisle. It does not matter. They're going to celebrate you up to this altar where you can grab my hand and we're going to pray for you. If you raise your hand to receive Christ this morning, will you come down right now in Jesus' name? Come right now. Get your free gift. Get it right now. Get it. Come on, bro. Yes. Yes. Awesome, bro. Good, good. Yeah, man. Yes. Good, good, good. Who else? Look at this, y'all. Who else? Come on. Come on. Who else? Gonna wait for you. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. I'm not letting you off. Uh uh, you raise your hand. You get your gospel fanny down here right now. Come on. Don't miss your opportunity. Don't do it. Don't do it. Come on. Come on. Yeah. Good. All right, now. Y'all kind of squeeze in right here. I don't want to belabor the point. Everything that I've said is true for each and every one of you. Right now, we're ready to settle things with God on his terms, not our own. Now, there's no magic prayer in the Bible that says, just say these three things, and, you know, this fixes everything immediately. But this has to just be a prayer that expresses where your heart is right now. And so I'm going to pray this prayer, and if you'll repeat out loud after me, what we're going to do is pray a prayer of repentance, a prayer of faith, a, pray, a prayer of receiving Christ, and by doing that, we're confessing to everybody present here in this room and the angels in heaven that you're saying yes to the gospel of Jesus Christ the biggest decision you've ever made in your life. It's right now. Hallelujah. Awesome. Those of you who came forward, in fact, anybody who's out in the, in the uh, congregation, if you want to join us, you can pray with us right now. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, come on. I repent of my sins right now. I turn away from sin and I turn toward you. I believe what Jesus did for me is enough to save me forever. I put my faith in Jesus right now. I believe the gospel. I receive the gospel. It's my, own. it's my own. I receive it as my own. I it as my own. 
and I confess before God and man that Jesus is mine and I am his. I am his. My sins are washed away. My righteousness has been settled. I'm a child of God forever. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Come on, you guys. Yes, 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 yes. Yes. Y'all, Pastor Jeff, what are we doing with these beautiful people? Meet me down here as soon as, as, soon as you release everybody. All right. God bless you guys. Have a fantastic day. The gospel is still good news, and it's still powerful in Jesus' name. Amen, somebody. God bless you. We'll see you soon.